his excerpts that give us the problems. Uh, I'd, li I'd like you to start on a two. Okay. Yeah. Well, Leonard Nimoy, I hope you keep making Star Trek movies because <laughs> at least I can count on seeing you once every two years right. uh, when a new Star Trek comes out. And uh, congratulations. I think this is just one whale of a movie. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes. I wonder, uh, Leonard, uh, of course, I think everybody knows by now that you are the director, and we don't want to give too much away, but of course, Spock kind of comes and goes in it. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of slid by that. I like the way you do that. That's right. <laughs> don't want to give too much away. Right. But um, the question is, in my mind, did you seek the director's job, or did they come to you and say, Leonard, how about directing Star Trek Three? No, I asked for the job. They came to me and asked if I wanted to be involved in Star Trek III in some way. Spock had died at the end of two. We had no future legal relationship. There was no contract with Paramount for Star Trek III. And they asked me if there was something I wanted to do. And I said, yes, I would like to direct the next picture. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised. The response was terrific. They got very excited about it. saying, wow, what a great idea. Leonard Nimoy directing Star Trek sounds good. Uh, Harv Bennett was very supportive. He had already been signed on to produce it and write it. And, uh, of course, they had no way of knowing, the studio had no way of knowing if I could handle the job. They knew that I knew Star Trek, but they didn't know if I could handle the uh, size of a motion picture. Harv was very supportive. He said, give it to him, he'll, he'll take care of it. And we finally worked it out. Then, uh, as far as your fellow actors, uh, did you talk to them ahead of time about your being director? I talked to some. I talked to Bill Shatner. Uh, um, I remember that specifically. We had a long talk about it. And I, I think I'd probably talk to DeForest Kelly about it. I don't remember any other conversations. But when we got down to the point where we were going to start making the picture, I was shooting the picture. I had already been on the job for several months preparing. I sensed when the actors came to work, all of them, that, uh, or most, that they were a little concerned about how this was going to go. I don't think that they had a, uh, a real fix on what our relationship was going to be, how we were going to work together. Was I going to be authoritarian, or was I going to, be, was I going to continue to be a friend and a fellow actor, or what? Uh, my feelings about them are all very positive, always have been. I enjoy them, I enjoy their characters, and I respect them. Uh, I felt my job with them was to make them comfortable, make them feel that I, I really wanted them to be comfortable and make a contribution to the picture. I think it shows on the screen. They had a good time. Leonard, in the back of your mind, it might even be a little bit in your subconscious, in putting this one together, did you think, now there are certain things that I wasn't that crazy about in the second one or the first one, and I want to be sure that we don't do that in this one or that we do more of something in this one. Just what I've just been talking about, for me, essentially, I felt that, that in Star Trek I, the characters were completely lost, uh, not used properly. Star Trek II was a good move in the right direction, where the story was about and involved the people. But I felt that we could go still further and, and get more out of these characters. It's a family of characters that the audience loves. They know these people. They've enjoyed them for years. They love to visit with them. And the humor and the charm and the loyalty, the friendship of these characters is something that the audience looks forward to and relishes. And I thought, I, I know about that, and I should be able to put some of that on the screen. And, uh, and that you have. I mean, the critics are all saying that mm. uh, this is, uh, has much more humanity. It's a family affair. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Will you uh, be directing or, or uh, being a, an actor in Star Trek IV? I have no idea. There are no specific plans yet. There has been some general conversation about making another film. And I suspect that if this picture does as well as everybody is, is anticipating, that, that they probably would, would think very strongly about, about making another film. But we haven't had any real firm conversation. There have been some very nice, flattering phone calls back in Portugal. You did a great job on this. Would you be interested in doing another one and that kind of thing? And I have said, yes, I would, directing, acting, or both. So it's likely that we'll be talking a lot in the near future about Star Trek IV. And uh, any hints as to what direction it might go? Well, I think there are a couple of loose ends that we've left unraveled at the end of this movie. I think the movie finishes successfully, but there are still some questions raised that, that could be dealt with uh, in, in a Star Trek IV. 
the condition of, of um, one or two of our central characters is, is in question. Uh, the condition of the enterprise is certainly in question. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Admiral Kirk has some explaining to do when he gets back to Earth for having stolen the enterprise and taken it out on this unauthorized mission. Uh, we could have some fun with Star Trek IV, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you had your druthers, which would you rather be, the director or the actor? I, I want to do some more directing. Uh, I've been wanting to for many, many years, and, and I have done a little bit here and there. I've done some television, done a lot of theater. But I really enjoyed being able to make a major investment in this project. Uh, I think actors make an important contribution, but a director makes the picture. A director directs the picture. And, and uh, it draws on so many other elements of yourself that you don't get to use as an actor that I'd like to do it again. I'd like to do more of it. Leonard, uh, to what extent did the furor caused by the Trekkies uh, when they found out about Star Trek II and Spock is dead, to what extent did that furor uh, influence what happened in Star Trek III? Well, uh, I think it probably had more influence on the end of Star Trek II than anything else because uh, there was a, a shot at the end of Star Trek II which, which showed Spock's tube with Spock's remains laying there on the Genesis planet. Now that, I think, was put in there intentionally with the idea that it might be a thread that could be picked up later and dealt with in a future story. So that as not to say to the audience, look, folks, don't give up hope totally here. Uh, yes, the man has passed on. Yes, we have said goodbye to him. We've all shed our tears if we want to or feel so uh, about him. But there's that tube laying there on this planet where some special genesis effect still seems to be operating. Something could happen. And I, I think the end of the picture really said there are always possibilities. So that, I think, affected the end of Star Trek II and led us into Star Trek III. And the ending of Star Trek III, again, I will not give it away, but Spock um, uh, does something, uh, a little gesture, and the audience just roars. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I, w <laughs> w were there many discussions about how you should do the final scene? What the condition of, of the character should be? Yes, yes, we talked about it a lot. Um, uh, Harv and I uh, uh, had a lot of discussions about what should be the final touch. How much do we want to say here? I think the whole idea. Uh, on the ending of the film is it should be touching. It should be a, a warm and touching reunion of people who care about each other and who have a loyal friendship to each other. Uh, there should be some questions raised about the future, but we should go out with a smile and, and feel good for having seen the picture. And I hope people feel that way after they've seen it. Well, it just gets a big laugh. Yeah. I mean, you've seen it, I'm yes. sure, many times with audiences. Yes, yes. <laughs> makes people feel good. <laughs> it's a tickle. It. How much creative or artistic control does Gene Roddenberry have? Gene has taken the position that he wants to take, which is the, the title of executive consultant, and he draws a salary for that, and he's on the lot all the time, and all of the materials that are written for any Star Trek movie go to him for his input, for his feedback, and he's very good at that. He reads the material and, and perhaps puts his thoughts on paper, or we have a meeting if we think it'll be useful. Uh, he was extremely supportive on this picture, uh, came often to the set and came often to the projection room to see the film that was being shot as the film was in progress, and was constantly telling me that he was happy with the way it was going, that he liked the focus on the people. Uh, he has been very generous on this picture. I heard him say recently that, that with this picture we have found the format for making Star Trek motion pictures, that it's been a trial and error process in the past and now we've done it. What about, again, not giving it away, but what about what happens to the Enterprise? Uh, didn't, <laughs> I, didn't Roddenberry just, you know, I think I'd just blow a gasket if I were Mr. Roddenberry. He was very concerned, but I don't think he was any more concerned than, than he was when it was decided that Spock should die at the end of Star Trek II. I mean, after all, <laughs> uh, a ship can be repaired, replaced, whatever. We're talking about a person here. The death of Spock, I would think, would, would be more difficult for Gene and everybody else to deal with than, than what might happen to a ship. And, and he supported that, or yeah. was he overruled? Well, it's the, no, 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 it's not a question of overruling. I think we came to an understanding that the way the thing happens in this picture, it's not gratuitous. It's not like we just decide to destroy something. There's a, there's a story involved, and if you see it in context, I think it makes sense. 
I, I found that people who were very concerned about it had heard rumors about what might happen to the ship. I found that when they're in the theater watching that scene develop, they realize it's the only thing that can be done. I mean, it's either the ship or these five or six friends of theirs. And, and under those circumstances, I think the audience accepts it totally. Well, Leonard, we could spend the rest of the day talking if they would let us, sure <laughs> and if you could hold up through right. another nine hours or whatever you've been through. Leonard, thank you so much. Lovely to see you, thank and you. I do think the film will be a fantastic hit. I hope you're right. It's I going to put, right. put a serious dent in that other movie that you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you <laughs> Thanks, so much. Leonard. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Just excellent. Right. Everybody's been coming out saying mm -hmm. what good interviews they've been getting. Be careful, it has oh. Stickers on it. Okay. You go back to home today, or? Uh, no. 